And now to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. David Michaels. As the nation's leading voice for protecting American workers, I would like to invite Dr. David Michaels, the Assistant Secretary for Occupational Health and Safety Administration, to lead us all. You don't need to give me a <laughs> He's one of few people I don't think we actually need to do that today with. But I think the leading voice for protecting America's work and safety is Cecil Roberts, who's here in the room. So you'll get to hear him at lunch, fortunately for all of us. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. We have a huge panel and um, not enough time to talk about all the things we want to talk about. Um, so I'll, I'll be somewhat brief, um, so we have enough time for everybody to cover things. But um, you know, when talking about Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, the one thing that often is forgotten in all the discussions, and we all talk about some of the outcomes being a strength in labor movement and the labor laws in New York and the um, fire codes, things we take for granted now. But you know, the workers' compensation system was integrally linked to um, Triangle. Up to that point, um, we really did have, we had no workers' compensation systems in the United States of any meaning. And when a worker was injured or killed on the job, it often lent led directly to immiseration. I mean, the there was no alternative source of income for many families. There was some, some success in lawsuits, very minor ones. But, you know, the reality was, you know, th this was destitution. And the workers' compensation system, for all of its, its failures, was a way to sort of get over that. But up until that point, and this may sound familiar to, to many of you, um, numerous, this was always on the state level, and numerous courts ruled that workers' compensation essentially was unfairly seizing the property of individuals, in this case of, of corporations and the corporate owners. And so if, every time a state tried to pass a workers' compensation law, it was overturned in the courts, just as child labor laws were being overturned and minimum wage laws. And in fact, two weeks before the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, the New York, a New York state court overturned the legislation that created the New York state workers' compensation system. But with Triangle, you know, you could, that changed the way courts looked at workers' compensation. Wisconsin followed immediately, and that's, um, with some minor changes in, in their law, they were able to essentially push it through, and many, many states followed. But 1911, in some ways, can be seen as the first year of organized government intervention in workplace safety and health. Through these, before that, there had been a number of state laws also around factory inspectors, but Wisconsin led the way in that case, um, and many states followed. Finally, by 1944, with Mississippi passing some workers' compensation legislation, every state had workers' comp. But workers' compensation remains somewhat unchanged since then. It pays um, medical bills within some constraints, and um, for low-wage workers, up to two-thirds of, um, of their lost wages. Uh, so it does... It makes, some, it makes a big difference in people's lives. But it's worth noting that the system really is a, a failure in many ways. Um, there are numerous studies that show that when a worker is injured on the job today, workers' compensation doesn't make them whole. They, it influences their long-term income, obviously their, their health care and their health status, but you can see the impact on communities, on families. There are studies that show that the educational impact of their children is impacted by a disabling injury. So there's lots that, that workers' compensation doesn't address. And of course, the basic idea that workers' compensation um, also has incentives for safe workplaces, really, is, we know that's a failure. Uh, workers' compensation, theoretically, is, you know, the premiums are based on um, experience and an unsafe employer would therefore pay more, and that has some incentive to um, provide more safety. It's that failure that really led to, to OSHA, as, as well as the, the failure of, of state systems in Kentucky and West Virginia to pay workers' compensation for black lung. I mean, the, you know, there's a litany of these failures. And that remains the case. And we, um, workers' comp plays very little role in actually protecting the health and safety of workers, of preventing injuries from occurring. So that was 100 years ago, and you know, I think we, everybody knows about some of the progress that was made as a result of Triangle and the, the um, labor movement and you know, the state laws that, that came from that. But we remained, the, the toll of workplace injuries and illnesses continued for the decades after Triangle. Um, they weren't well understood because we didn't have any national agency that really attempted to, to collect the information in a very uh, systematic way. The um, estimates from the National Safety Council in 1970 was that there were 13,800 fatalities a year in the workplace. But that was based on essentially sending out some surveys, talking to some employers, looking at newspaper articles. We know it was an imprecise estimate, though it looks very precise, because they came up with the same number three years in a row. Um, <laughs> and 
I'm not criticizing them, but it was the best they could do at the time. Um, workers' compensation was still there. There were certainly safe, there were industrial safety programs. Um, and the episodic catastrophes, often in the mines, um, really drove an understanding that we weren't doing enough. Um, and so in 1970, with the, um, the, the civil rights movement, Earth Day and the environmental movement, Congress on a bipartisan basis passed the OSHA Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, signed by President Nixon, and the, the clips are really wonderful of him signing it in late 1969, um, giving the Labor Department 120 days to start the, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So actually next month is the 40th anniversary of OSHA. Um, and, and we have reasonably good statistics since then, so we could talk about sort of what's, you know, what's happened since then. And I think we've made some great progress. I mean, there were you know, 13,800 deaths a year, if we, if we accept that number, that was 38 a day. And we have a, work, a workforce now that's almost twice as large, and we're down to 12 a day. And that's probably a reasonably good number of actually people who die as a result of workplace injuries that we identify right there. That doesn't include, of course, occupational illnesses that could come you know, a month or 20 or 30 or 40 years after exposure. Um, and doesn't, you know, we get reports of 3 million injuries a year, in, serious enough to be recorded by OSHA. And that's a, obviously, a, it's an underestimate. There are lots of reasons for that, and we probably don't have to, enough time to talk about that today. But what the attitude that we saw in the owners of the Triangle Shortwaist Fire hasn't disappeared today. It's certainly much less acceptable. I think socially that was probably, 100 years ago, that w it was unquestioned. And I think with... OSHA, with MSHA, with, with um, the just strength in public health. When we look at individual cases, we say that obviously that behavior isn't acceptable, that attitude toward worker safety, but it still occurs all the time. There are lots of employers who try to do the right thing, who, who do take care of their workers, but you know, we see situations which are analogous to, to Triangle on a regular basis. I mean, the stories are really remarkable. We have um, one employer in, two minutes left? Okay, one employer in Texas, we, um, one of our inspectors saw smoke coming out of a manhole, and we went there and found some work being done in a confined space with equipment that obviously shouldn't have been done, issued a citation. Um, a few months later, saw that same employer digging a trench with no protection at all, and the workers were very much at risk of, of being caught in a trench collapse, so we issued a citation for that. And then we were called a few months later on a fatality investigation. The same worker who we found in that manhole, the first time had been overcome in a different sewer, from gas, um, and then shortly after that, we found another trenching violation. At that point, the attorneys for the company said, wait a minute, why are you giving us a fine? We get it now, we're trying to do the right thing. And so that idea that you have to have fatalities before people really see that they need to do is, is still unfortunate and still rampant. Um, so we're very much focused on trying to get that message out. Uh, we're, as we discussed earlier, we are very much focused on the most vulnerable workers in the United States, uh, non-English speaking workers, low literacy workers, uh, workers who are afraid to, to, um, to claim their rights, to express their rights, or may not even know them, because they are put in the, the worst situations. And as long as we have some workers who are unfortunately required to take jobs where there is no safety, where protections aren't given, and where there's wage theft at the same time, that by making those jobs viable and essentially um, um, you know, enabling those employers and incentivizing those employers to cut corners on safety, to, to steal wages, that drives down the safety and the wages of all employers and all other workers who, tried, who are trying to do the right thing. So we're very much focused on trying to reach out to those communities to um, tell, tell employers that they have to train workers in the language that they speak. That you, can't, you can't hire people, expect them to do a dangerous job without telling them how to do the job safely, and that has to be done in the language that they speak. Um, Working very hard on that. Uh, in the audience here is also Jordan Barab, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary. Uh, we'll be around a little bit, so maybe we could talk more about some of this later. So thank you all so much, and we'll see where this all goes. So. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Michaels, for your leadership and all that you do to protect our workers.